Hi there, everyone. My name is Max Young, and I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of Vermin's Bookstore to tonight's virtual event. Tonight, we are lucky to have with us author Meryl Marco in conversation with Susan Orland discussing Meryl's book, We Saw Scenery. We're so grateful that we can continue bringing authors to you during this uncertain time and that you're able to continue supporting us. Uh, tonight's event does include a Q&A portion, so if you'd like to ask Meryl a question at any point, you can go ahead and click this Ask a Question button towards the bottom, and they'll get to that at some point during the event. And if you would like to purchase Meryl's book, you can go ahead and click this green button down there, and it'll take you to our website. Uh, but let me go ahead and introduce our guest for this evening. First off, we have Meryl Marco, who was the head writer for the original David Letterman show and the co-creator and first head writer of NBC's groundbreaking Late Night with David Letterman, for which she won three Emmy Awards. She engineered the majority of the show's original concepts and created the segments Stupid Pet Tricks, Stupid Human Tricks, and Viewer Mail. Marco also won a Writers Guild Award for her writing and performance work on HBO's Not Necessarily the News. She has written for television shows such as Sex and the City, Newhart, and Moonlighting, and has written for many periodicals, including Rolling Stone, Time, US Weekly, People, Esquire, The New York Times, and The Los Angeles Times. And with her is Susan Orlin, who has been a staff writer at The New Yorker since 1992. She's the author of seven books, including The Library Book, Rin Tin Tin, Saturday Night, and The Orchid Thief, which was made into an Academy Award-winning film adaptation. But with that all out of the way, I will go ahead and let them take over. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> now we're on. Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. And thank you, Meryl, for inviting me to be your chat partner. Well, um, thank, you. Brilliant. thank you for saying yes. Oh, well, my pleasure. And I think we should begin with the appropriate toast to Meryl, to her book. Well, it's cocktail hour. It's cocktail hour. And to... All good things. I'm glad this week is. Uh, our, uh, we're trying to <clears throat> make our glasses look as good as possible. Can you do it? Can you do it? Possible. There you go. Um, it's a good week to be celebrating. So cheers. It's also a good a good week to be reading your book. And to begin <laughs> with, big, big, wild, broad question, which is, how did this book come about? And how did you make the decision to write a memoir? Well, I didn't ever make the decision to write a memoir. I um, I never wanted to write a memoir, actually. <clears throat> but what I was doing is, I have I don't I, I have the feeling you are not like this. I have I save boxes and boxes of stuff I think are funny, and I have them all over my office. And it's a habit I picked up, I think, working on the Letterman Show, because I realized that anything I thought was funny, I could make into a segment. And then I went on in life when I just primarily been a writer to think everything I think is funny has some use in my life as a writer. So I save stuff and save stuff. And then, of course, I have to do a lot of cleaning out of the office because um, you can't live like that unless you want your own segment on hoarders, which I'm not yeah. sure I want. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, um, not a bad goal, but. You got to have goals. Anyway, I was cleaning out a box and I found these little diaries that uh, my mother bought me, which I knew I was saving, but I didn't know where they were. And they were at the bottom of a big box of other stuff. And the thing that got my attention about them first apart from the fact that uh, I hadn't seen them in a while, was they had a lock and a key, which really made me laugh because, you know, what was I writing at 11 that I needed to lock up like that? I mean, I'm not writing anything nearly that important now. So I thought, well, this would be kind of funny. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sit down, knowing that I've become a writer, and review them like a piece of literature, at like, you know, the early works of Meryl Marco. Mm -hmm. So I sat down to read them and uh, and what I found was something that I didn't expect. First of all, I realized I didn't know what you did with a diary when I got them. So, uh, so I just wrote down every single thing I did every day, which I certainly don't do in diaries I keep now, you know, I, but it was interesting and amusing to read because it was like a litany of all my opinions about pop culture and all the radio show contests that I was joining, you know, they, it was just, if you had said to me, what did you do when you were 11? I would have gone, was that Girl Scouts at 11? I think that was 12, you know, but now suddenly I knew every single thing I had done at 11 and everything I did at 12, et cetera. So I thought, well, I should do something with this. And I, 
I re also realized that I only remembered about a third of it. Um, the, I, as I was reading it, I kind of remembered about a third of it. And then a lot of it was like, and, and then it was weird also to me what stuff I did remember and what stuff I had forgotten. For instance, a day that I had written down as the worst day ever, um, no memory of that, but a horrible sandwich I remembered really distinctly. So I just thought, what is it with the brain function that I'm saving sandwiches when I'm throwing out the horrible day? And I started trying to assemble that into something, you know, and it took a, a pretty long time. I was doing drawings. I have an art degree and I hadn't been doing drawings for years. And I thought, well, maybe this would be a funny comic strip to do where I would just have an 11 year old girl talking to you from the sixties. And, uh, and then as I started assembling it, I started showing it to friends and they were all going, no, it's a book. And I was saying, well, it's too random to be a book. So it, it took a bunch of years to figure out how to make a structure. And, and actually for me to figure out what the story arc was, of my early life, I didn't really ever give it any thought. You know, I had to find sort of an arc to make it readable, sort of. So it was, you know, it was a tricky thing to assemble. To say nothing of the fact that it was a, a damn jigsaw puzzle with all those drawings. You know, I'd written other books, but my God, the I the JPEGs. I mean, it was it was tricky. And did you always um, envision it as a graphic book? Well, you know, it all went sort of ass backwards, which is, as it turns out, the way a lot of stuff in my life goes. Um, I I envisioned it as a comic strip, and then I started doing more and more and more of it just because I was enjoying it and not sure what I was going to do with it. But I was doing the drawings all along. I originally, I didn't originally think that I would add my adult perspective to it, which is what ties the whole book together at this point. I thought it's funny to just hear me at eleven talking about Girl Scouts and I would just illustrate it um, and just see what that looked like. Cause I couldn't exactly remember. And by the way, I remembered almost nothing that happened at my Girl Scout meetings. And it turned out almost all of my Girl Scout meetings were uh, were like domestic um, indoctrination. Oh, that really hit home for me, by the way. I was a brownie. I was a brownie too. Yeah, and I absolutely, I worshiped it. But I do think a lot of what we were doing was learning how to iron. And so we were we were collecting recipes and we learned how to cook eggs. And uh, and I was just thinking, what that isn't what they thought of when they when the Juliet Low, that was her name, right? I remember yeah. Juliet Low Day. Uh, no, I wanted to learn how to make a fire by striking rocks together. But I still loved it. I don't know why. Well, we yeah, we never. Uh, we never learned any of that. We we uh, so anyway, that was interesting to me that I had blacked out all of Girl Scouts. I remembered the uniform, and that was about it. But um, now I forget what I was. Oh, so as I, I forget what the question was. I, well, I was asking whether you always pictured it as a graphic rather than just a conventional book. I didn't picture it at all. What I was doing was accumulating all this stuff. And then as I accumulated it and somebody, a bunch of my friends started going, well, it's a book. I started thinking, well, how is it a book? How do you make it into a book? It's just 11 year old, a 12 year old, a 13 year old telling you. And then I did this and then I did that. And then I did. This. And I thought, well, that's too self-involved and it's too egomaniacal. I don't want it to be that. And then as I started, trying at that point I started trying to envision it as a book but it was always the drawings and the diaries and then I started doing overview writing and that's when it really became a book because just the diaries and the drawings really although I had a friend tell me I should just leave it at that I felt like it needed um, my adult perspective and I really felt I needed that at the point at which um, uh, I started seeing stuff in there that that made me uh, gasp like when it turned out. I mean, I kind of remembered this, but I didn't exactly remember it. From the ages of uh, fourth grade through sixth grade, I was in love with a Nazi. And I kind of remembered that that was going on, but I didn't remember it being Nazi. I just, I, I wasn't identified enough as Jewish in my own mind. I mean, I knew we were Jewish, but I we didn't do religion. So I didn't really, have anything tied to it. I thought he was paying attention to me. I should add for people who are, have no idea what I'm talking about. 
that uh, the boy I was deeply in love with from fourth to sixth grade would uh, do Heil Hitler when he saw me. And I thought he was paying attention. Good. Oh, God. <laughs> it's so painful. It, it, it is painful. I mean, part of the humor of the book is that cringy um, feeling that you get when you see the obliviousness of a kid. Well, that's where I thought about writing myself into the frame and going, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and yeah. I started doing that. And then it, that that helped it become more of a book when I started adding my own adult stuff into it. And I also realized when I was doing that, that there's no possible way if I had been around through some magic of a time machine to talk to myself that I would have paid any attention to myself. What, what do you mean? Well, if I had said to myself, do you understand that this guy is making fun of you? I would have said, you don't know everything. You know, I mean, I wouldn't have listened. Right. Well, it's the way we all were with our mothers, of course. Which yeah. is when they're going, wait a minute, you're in love with a Nazi. And you, your response is, oh, you think you know everything. I know everything. Well, I would have thought that my mother would have said something to me about that. So I have a feeling I never told her that part. I mean, she certainly heard about him, but I don't think I ever told her the Heil Hitler stuff. <laughs> That's wow. the very essence of a good romance. <laughs> yeah, I mean, somewhere in there is true love, right? That's how I feel when I look at Richard Spencer, you know? Yeah, it's, it's there, it's happening. David Duke, you know. So when you're working, um, I'm really curious about just the process when you're writing and making art and how that how that works is it that you take a section from the diary and then illustrate it after you've chosen the piece or how how does that like, work well i think what i was doing I, I, there was a period of time where i was doing both at the same time when i was just verbatim translating the diaries but there there came a time where I just did straight writing. I wanted it to read like a book. And then I, whatever I found worked inside that book, then I went back and did all the rest of the drawings. Cause um, it was really important to me that it read, you know, like I have a lot of feelings about things that read and things that don't read and how, what wording is okay. And so I, I got all that stuff pulled together. And then of course there was a ton of collating. I mean, I've seen your, uh, on where, things that you post with all your papers on the biggest table in the universe, which can't be in that little studio now, is it? No, sadly, it's not. <laughs> it wouldn't fit, actually. But that's the dream work surface, just this giant flat, just like a corporate boardroom table. It is the. It definitely is the the perfect thing. Well, I I was um at by the the time that I really. I started out doing a million legal pads, just sort of looking, collating pages and trying to make some kind of narrative because I couldn't figure out where the narrative was really because it was my own life. And so I was, I did a whole lot of collating for a whole lot of time. And that stuff was all just notes on paper. It wasn't on the big table, but it was notes on pads and pads of paper. I did a whole lot of that. And then the second half of the book, oddly enough, the first half of the book, the drawings, were pencil and pen because I I come from like a painterly background and um and I thought okay I'm old school you can't teach me new tricks and so I want to do drawings with paper and pencil and stuff and then I wanted to also use Photoshop because I'm good at Photoshop now so I would put it in Photoshop and put it out of Photoshop and then draw more with a pencil and pen by the time that I sold the book which was at the halfway point. Um, and they wanted me to do 50% more, I started working on an iPad with digital stuff. And uh, it's hard to get me back on the pencil at this point you, because of one thing that somebody should have won the Nobel Peace Prize for. Um, when you're drawing on an iPad digitally, there's a thing called an undo button. So you don't, when you make a mistake, you don't have to get a new piece of paper and figure anything out again. You just go right back to the spot where you made the mistake. There you are. It's so great. Yeah. So you did the second half using, um, the, I mean, it's interesting because you would never know looking at the book that there was a, a change in the 
the method that you were using. Can, That's interesting. I can you tell. Know. Yeah, but I mean, it's, I'm I'm all for the digital drawing now. Ever since they came up with the Apple Pencil, it's so easy. It used to be, I've, I've taken various stabs at this stuff over, over the years. And actually, you know, I never thought I would do a graphic novel at all because I, I'm friends with Mimi Pond and I went over to her house one time and saw a graphic novel she was working on. She was sitting in a room with a stack of papers this high next to her, all little drawings. And I just went, you know, when I was in art school, I used to have that kind of patience, but I don't have it now. I just, I don't have that kind of patience now. And the next thing, you know, I'm sitting at it <laughs> with the giant. I, I didn't expect I would do it, you know, but I was enjoying it. So I kept doing it. But when well, you do it on an iPad, you, there's no more stack of stuff. It's just JPEGs on the that's iPad. Amazing. It is amazing. I mean, our, Meryl and I have a very close mutual friend and she and I first met when Lori? We were at, uh, Lori at um, a writer's colony together and Lori was doing a graphic novel and was drawing literally for 18 hours a day and got horrible carpal tunnel um, just um, or tendonitis or something from the physical effort of all of that drawing. And now, I mean, this was a long time ago and I'm not sure, I don't think Apple Pencil existed, you know. Well, you, would think you would get a thing, some kind of a drawing tablet and it was upside down and backwards kind of, you would either. Um, yeah, it, it, she had some device, but she, she was just drawing furiously. And at that point I was really struggling with my book and I thought, well, at least I don't have to draw the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, work. it's really a lot of work, but then so is writing a book. I mean, what's more work than writing a book? It's so much work. Oh, it's horrible actually, but just not to put, put too fine a point on it, but it's horrible. Um, one thing I'm very curious about is the challenge of writing about your family and you make a, you make a point in the book about writing about people you love and you make a lot of fun of your brother and you, you sort of describe your relationship with him as a kid as being very fractious and he's a pain in the ass and you're kind of taunting each other and you make a comment about how you love him and he's a wonderful guy. But what is it like and what was it like for you to get, to really write in a very authentic way about, about your family, about the people you're close to? Well, um, uh, as you might, <laughs> I don't think you did guess, but you might guess they're not with us anymore. So there's not repercussions. Like when they were alive and I would write things about them. Um, Your parents we're talking about. My parents, I never really wrote about my brother. My brother turned into such a different creature that um, my brother turned into an archeologist who, who was a specialist in the second century Middle Eastern artifact and was a museum curator for 30 years. So he didn't turn into an adult version of somebody who turned the lights on and off in my room and went, uh. <laughs> Thank God. You know, that was, that turned into Donald Trump, right? Yeah. 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 So, but my brother's gone too. So um, he, uh, his sons have not read it yet. And I'm a little worried about that, but I think they know that uh, who their dad, that their dad wasn't that kid. So, um, but it was sort of important to me to, I was trying to bring a little perspective to the, because I was reading my own stuff, the little perspective to the sort of stuff I was bringing to the party. That was what I never really thought about. I mean, I didn't get along with my mother. She was very narcissistic and she was really, really angry. Um, I think she was one of those women from that period where she had jobs, including in, uh, she was sort of a wannabe writer and she had a lot of work during World War II. She was one of those people who skipped a lot of grades in New York and she got out early and then she got a job as a copywriter at Time Magazine. And she had sort of a, a bustling career. And then the guys came home from World War II and she got married and my dad didn't want her to work. And she was, she spent the whole rest of her life being uh, pissed off. And wouldn't say why, didn't know why, I don't think. She wasn't introspective, she just was angry. And if you said to her, what's the matter? She'd go, you put that 
cup down over there. And, you know, that was as far as it would go, like cup placement. That would be right. the way that, so, uh, but then I was trying to figure out what, what I brought to it too, you know? So I was sort of analyzing my own words to figure out, you know, I wasn't, it wasn't that I was doing nothing. On the other hand, she was just extremely angry. So she was gonna find something to be angry at. And in your memory, was she sort of raging all the time or was were there sort of peaceful periods? She was ra raging all the time, but there was, she was up and back, you know, it, she was dangerous in the sense that she was very smart. So she'd get you to talk to her and then she'd find things you said to her that made her angry because that's, what narcissism does. It's, uh, and while I'm talking about this, where are Right. Um, you're, they, entitled. you're entitled. I mean, talking about difficult mothers, and you and I have shared some of this in the past about I had a very difficult mother as well. And um, it's, you never quite, I mean, there's no getting over anyone's parents. You you are the product of the relationship you have with them. But that particular, and I do, I agree with you. I think there was a, a, a huge generation of women, and maybe not just one generation, many generations, but that generation in particular where they had a taste of autonomy and then had it sort of withdrawn and then had this thwarted ambition and idea of what they might be. And instead they were housewives and mothers. And yeah, I got the, I never got the feeling that she liked it. You know, it's, I think the reason that I've, I never had kids. I didn't get the feeling my mother enjoyed having kids. And it looked mm -hmm. to me like she was behaving a lesson for me. That was don't do what I did. So, you know, I don't know that, I mean, that wasn't a necessarily a smart lesson to have gotten from somebody, but um, but it's the lesson I got from her. She was just, she was um, very difficult. Did she, or either of your parents, um, ever get you, did they ever understand your humor or sort of get you more than they did when you were a kid. Not, not really. They didn't get me. <laughs> they, they were um, before they both died. They saw some amount of things that I had done, but they didn't really, they didn't really get it in any. I, I mean, my mother used to say, "Everything's a joke to you. Is everything a joke?" And I remember thinking, kind yeah. of, you know, not everything, I guess, but most things, you know. <laughs> but did they uh, and? Did they ever appreciate your humor or your your no. perspective? N not really. No, they were they. But that, that's another thing. I don't know if that's generational or if that's Jewish. They really felt like their role in my life was to sort of dissemble me, to take me apart, and like if they didn't tell me all the things that were wrong with me, who was going to tell me? Like it's an important thing in life for somebody to tell you all the things that are wrong with you, which, you know, I certainly don't think that is a good thing to do with people. I mean, I don't know anyone who wants to hear it. Mm -hmm. Maybe if so, in fact, if somebody says, will you critique this thing for me? I almost always say, well, what state of writing is it in? Is it almost finished? Do you want to hear what sort of, I mean, you, you have to be tactful. You can't just take people apart, but that I think they thought that's what the job of a parent was, was to just let you know how off the mark you were. They thought that was the way they were helping you grow up or something. I don't, I don't know, that's the best I can figure out. Yeah, I, I wonder where that comes from. I mean, honestly, what, because I feel like I don't understand enough the forces that influence their childhood. I mean, yeah, no, I don't either. Then they she they wouldn't talk about it. They were not conversant in it, so you couldn't get an answer from them. Yeah. Did, um, I, I also did think you appreciate your books? She did. She I have to say, I mean, our mothers had some similarity, but in many ways they were very different. My mother, I'm sitting here with a stack this high 
my mother has saved every single thing I ever wrote, even the most, even the, the things that I wrote the earliest point in my career that were not memorable in any way. And she cut it out and put it in a scrapbook and um, she was my greatest supporter. So I had a different experience in that way. I mean, even to her, it was all, it didn't matter if it was some teeny tiny thing I wrote or the lead story in the New Yorker. It was just like all good, all, and I feel lucky. I mean, it wasn't very nuanced, but on balance, it's nice to have someone who's just your great champion. So you don't have a voice in your head that's telling you that things that you do are no good. I do, but I think it's my voice. <laughs> I don't think it's my parents. Well, where did you get that voice then? If you didn't get it from a parent, yeah. wouldn't it be imprinted at a young age? Well, I shouldn't say that. It's not, I don't think that I have a voice that's telling, no, I, I, I don't have that voice. I, I, I'm lucky because my dad was very challenging. And even after I'd published several books, he kept telling me I should go to law school. Um, so I'd have something to fall back on. My mom always, to her, I was the best writer in the world. And she would have stories of mine sitting out in the kitchen, like framed. So she could yeah. read them over and over again. So, um, you know, she was, I, I feel like I don't, I didn't appreciate it as much as I do now and realize what that means to, yeah. it wasn't phony. She really thought it was fantastic. So I, I feel lucky, believe me, because I do think it, it you know, we're all so caught up in this fear of spoiling kids but I think she just really exulted in it. Well, kids just want reinforcement, I think. I mean, if it's a normal kid and you're not dealing with a horrible behavioral disorder or something, kids just want to hear that you're doing a good job. You know, I, they don't really need to hear a lot of specific critiquing. I right. I know. I mean, that's what's also funny is the parent who reads your work and says, you know, I didn't really like the first sentence. And you think, no, 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 you don't understand. That isn't your job. That's my editor's job. Your your job is to say, oh, my God, I love you. And I'm so proud of you for having done this. So. Exactly. In fact, I, I this is a good place for me to repeat an anecdote I've told before. But when I decided I was going to um, move to Los Angeles by myself and try to pursue writing for television, I wrote uh, some spec scripts and my mother insisted on reading them uh, the night before I went, you can see where this is going, uh, right be the night before I drove to Los Angeles and she puts them on her lap and she sits down and I see she's no facial expression, nothing is happening on her face. And, um, and so I pace around and finally uh, she closes it and she's done. And then uh, she looks up at me like, this is my the face my mother most often made. <laughs> and so I said to her, so what do you think? And she says, well, I don't happen to care for them, but I pray I'm wrong. Whoa. And then I went and took a shower. <laughs> and the next day I moved to Los Angeles and I got a job almost the minute I got to Los Angeles. So it's a good thing I had learned not to take her too seriously. But that's, a, that you know, I didn't really realize what a funny statement that was until I started trying to do it. When I used to do stand up, I did it on stage. And it almost always got a laugh. And I thought, hey, you know what? I was right. It is funny. <laughs> it is funny. It reminds me of, um, do you know Megan Amram? Um, She's a, she writes for a lot of comedy shows and she. Oh, has, yes, I do know. I didn't yeah, know. She had as her Twitter bio right. a quote from her mother saying it's that unfunny, <laughs> describing her humor, saying it's that unfunny kind of humor. <laughs> so something I'm mangling it, but it, it was so hilarious because you think, oh my God, what a thing to say to your kid who's a comedy writer. Oh, yeah. You're doing that unfunny kind of comedy. 
Yeah. That, that's that, you yeah. know. She basically had my mother, it sounds like. It, right. Uh, it's, <laughs> it, it's, you can laugh about it, but obviously there's a lot of pain. Well, in, it's just it isn't an, it isn't a um, a support system. It's the opposite of the support system, whatever that is. So you just you just have to be in your adult life, learn to be smart enough to grow past the that voice which rushes in first, pretty much on everything I do. The first voice that rushes in is, I'm I'm not crazy about it. I don't. Know. And then, and you have to rush past that on to some other saner vision of yourself. Yeah. So, do you think that um, it's a it's sort of a truism that most funny people suffered through at at the very least through their adolescence, but more likely through much of their life? Do you do you think that's part of um, the wellspring of humor. I think humor is born of, uh, yeah, uh, basically. I mean, <laughs> a lot of funny people are really steeped in misery. You know, the smarter among them are working with it and going to a therapist or whatever. But yeah, it comes out of it comes out of a power struggle, is what I've finally decided about it. Because you know, when you think about it, what a great thing humor is and how cool it is. What you do when you when you decide to restructure something, like for instance, I was hospitalized a couple of years ago and instantly I started making jokes and I started thinking to myself, okay, here's what's going on is you take a situation where you have no control and you are rewriting it so that you're the controlling party. You're, you're, you redone the narrative a hundred percent. That is the greatest way to live. I think, you know, it's such a wonderful, adaptation to awfulness to just rewrite it all it's i think that humor is mostly about about writing wrongs about about the little guy coming out on top think about all those you know people who did comedy in the 30s those kind of charlie chaplin people it's all about the poor little schlemiel who suddenly is is a power broker it's um and it continues to be like that it's a it's a really great adjustment to life, I think. I, I love it. One thing that I always think of as the ultimate humor is, and you and I are both dog owners and dog lovers, but my favorite thing is if a dog accidentally falls, they pretend immediately that they intended it. <laughs> and I have always thought that it's brilliant. It's the only time where you think, God, they have a sense of humor that taking this embarrassing moment as long as they take control of it and pretend that they intended it and it's very funny but also they end up on top there are some dogs that are funnier than others though i've thought about that a lot like are they in on it at all you know i've had dogs that you know apparently dog smiling which is you always think look he's smiling and apparently that's not smiling or some dogs will tell you that it's not smiling. But I've had dogs that seem to play along, like seem to know that if they're making you laugh, that's a positive thing that leads to treats or something, and and to play along with it. You know, they don't all do that. It's and I I credit that with being sort of a dog sense of humor is yeah. pandering to laughs. Sort. Yeah. Well, it's um, it's a it's an interesting thing to imagine. I mean. To me, humor is so complicated. It's and it's fascinating if you could figure out what makes something funny. It seems it's beyond explanation. It, it's it's so complex and and it fascinates me. So the idea that animals could do it, I mean, it's just that, and I'm sure there's some other explanation that if a dog falls by accident, they know that if the other dogs see them falling, they'll assume they're injured and they'll kill them. I mean, there's well, probably that. You <laughs> must have that there's that weird, awful part of dogs that where one of them gets sick and the others just sort of turn on them. Oh, they do. I mean, that, that, and this is true with all animals that, I mean, I had chickens for a long time and one of my chickens 
I had an injury because actually my dog bit her, but my, and you can't let the other chickens see the injury. And so you get a medicine that you paint on the injury to make it, to remove the red color. Wow. It's called, not called bluing, but it's, it's a blue dye that you put on the injury because if the other chickens see this red mark on the chicken, they'll peck it to death because their thought is, well, you're, you're a liability. You're, you're not well, we can't afford to have you around. So we're going to kill you. Anyway, I can't believe we're talking about this, but I no, no. people should buy Meryl's book. <laughs> Why are the facts yeah. talking Where about how you, Where did, uh, how you paint okay. chickens with um, blue dye so they don't kill each other? I think we're supposed to take um, questions now. Is that yes? I'm oh, here's my book. I was asked to hold my book up. Here's my book, and it really is. And the title of it, by the way, I'll explain the title um, just briefly. The title uh, appears in some of my diaries. It was what I, uh, how I described things that were not me. Like when I would go on a family vacation, I would go, we went to the Florida Keys, we saw scenery, which is like the least descriptive way to de describe anything and couldn't have been used by me at any other point. When I saw it the first time, it just made me laugh out loud. Scenery, you know, it just... I don't know whose words I was using then, but it's, it's. But it also, to me, why I loved it is that there's this um, yo-yoing in the book between you as a young person inflating the importance of tiny things, like you're saying the sandwich, and then minimizing and completely generalizing about things that are actually huge, like worst day ever, best sandwich, which had lettuce, a drizzling of mustard, you know, where you get super specific and you think this is, this is why kids are so mysterious because <laughs> you can't figure out their, the way they've kind of categorized things that are important. And your description of seeing these epic landscapes on the, a trip that you take with your families, we saw scenery. Well, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> So I think, let me see if I'm going to work this thing properly. I'm okay. So the questions, uh, and folks, it looks like some of you have asked questions in the non question asking section. But um, I think somebody has did a shout out to Lori Sandell. On, on oh. <laughs> so cool. let's, let's okay. acknowledge her. She wrote, she wrote the imposter's daughter. Oh, all right, great. Actually, I think she was going to tune in. So let me... Um, Lori, who wrote it. <laughs> oh, busted, Lori. Um, oh, it is Lori who wrote it. <laughs> oh, Lori, that's horrible. It's um, okay, so love the conversation you had with yourself in the book. What was it like talking with yourself? Was it like talking to a memory of yourself or with a totally different person or an alternate version of yourself? Um, I, you know, I've done a lot of script writing in my life. So it was me talking to the character that I, that I thought I had assembled based on me. <laughs> I don't really remember myself all that well as a person at those ages is I was realizing, I don't remember, being really inhabiting my body. And I don't exactly know who I was doing before I turned into me now. I think I was doing my mother and my friends. So I was kind of a vacant amalgam of, of things I don't really have in my personality right now. So I was talking to that. I was talking to the person that, that had all those references in that diary, that if, if she was a character. I don't know if that answers the question. Uh, that makes sense. Um, how do you rewire or work around that critical parental voice as an adult, especially once it's internalized, asking for a friend? <laughs> I have an answer for that. And then if, if you have an answer for that, well, you don't have that critical voice, Susan. You said, I, I hear, I, I have my mother. It's amazing to me. I'm carrying my mother with me. She's been dead 20 years. 
and I'm, I carry her around with me as the first negative thing I hear about everything I do always. And then I push her aside. I mean, I, she was proven wrong. And I don't know why she was acting like that, but, uh, and also I went to a lot of therapy, but, but I just see her as an unhappy person who, um, who had a big effect on my life and also taught me how to write weirdly enough. She wanted to be a writer and she used to grade my papers when I was in, in school. She used to do, you know, those, you'll remember this Susan. you remember and the, uh, what editors used to do this stuff of new paragraph and yeah. uh, all those long things they did. Yeah. She would do that all over my papers. I really didn't want her to. And I actually didn't want to be a writer because she was making such a, to do over my papers, but she did teach me how to write. So weirdly, um, there was a good part too, but I just, I just 86 her voice, you know, her voice is with me all the time and I just go shut up. <laughs> it, it gets down to that really. It gets down. I found a lot of growing up in life has to do with just telling yourself to shut up. Yeah. Actually, these two questions, um, the next two, they're, similar in the sense of, do you think you would have achieved what you would have, what you have if you hadn't had a critical parent? And this next question is, would you have been so funny or followed these careers without such a neurotic mother? Can you even imagine how you would have turned out? So they're, they're sort of similar. Well, I, found, I have found like, a, I'm, I have a really analytical brain, so I catalog stuff. I don't know if you do this, Susan, but I've I, I put things in categories and whenever I get two of something, I remember it. And then when the third one comes in, it goes right into the spot with the other two. And it's a thing I do. And I have been cataloging funny uh, women. I have a lot of funny women friends and I've been, I always talk to them about their backgrounds and I've been cataloging them for years, for decades, maybe three decades. And I would say, I know one person who didn't have that mother um, of all these women. And uh, and all the rest of them had this one mother. <laughs> she gave birth to all the compulsively funny people in the world. It's weird, and a lot of the guys too. A lot of a lot of guys have that mother. Obviously, Larry David had her. Um, she's those women. They're the survival rate with those women is about learning to rewrite the whole scenario so that you are the person with the power. So in a sense, it's, I mean, obviously it's impossible to imagine oneself with a different parent, but it's possible to say it's quantifiable that a big piece of your personality is in response to that. Yeah, but I think that like you just described your own mother, I think that her approach was better. And I have friends who are artists who have generations of artist kids and they all seem to get along and they're all productive. So I don't think, I do think that if you are a certain kind of person and you've got that really critical parent, you you defy them and go on to be who you wanna be anyway. On the other hand, I think not everybody triumphs out of those people. You know, I mean, there are serial killers with moms like that too. <laughs> I don't think my mom was quite as bad as the mom of a serial killer, but I would rather have had a mom like, more like your mom if she was gonna be critical, just where the support system was really broad I, mean, I really don't see any reason not to raise a kid and not give them support, a support system. They're just, there's nothing to be gained really. I've got to say as a parent, it's a, it's an odd thing. I mean, my son is 15 and there's certain, certainly lots of things that he does or behaviors of his that I feel critical of, but that, that kind of generalized negativity is very puzzling to me. Um, and, and I agree with you. I think it, it's coming from some frustration or anger that is not being expressed. Are you talking about the parent now or your son? <laughs> I'm confused. No, I'm saying I, I don't know where the mothers who are so critical, oh. you know, it's some pathology that, you know, because I think your instinct is to nurture your kids. Um, well, we didn't have serotonin reuptake inhibitors in the days of my mother either. I think if she'd been taking one of those, it would have been better. I think she was in a big depression and she didn't identify it as such. And so she just was looking for the things in her life 
as a way to vent. And yeah. um, and uh, it's it's uh, I think it's a bad way to be. I wish she would have been around for for uh, Prozac. It might have helped her. I'm yeah. Um, okay. Here's a question. Do you remember writing about your childhood diaries for New York Woman? It was beginning of 1990. Magazine then printed my letter, appreciative of your piece. Was there a reason you looked at the diaries back then? And how did that compare to your reaction or motivation more recently? Yeah, I was. I, I looked at them for the same reason back then. Well, I was doing a, a monthly column for New York Woman, which was this very cool magazine. I don't know if you ever saw it, but yeah, it yeah. A, it Wendy Wasserstein was writing for it. It was um, it was a, a really cool little magazine. And, uh, and it was the first time I'd ever written print. And I was doing this monthly column, and I, it was the first time that I realized that that month deadline was around again, and I didn't have an idea, you know. And you just start going, "All right, I wrote about the dogs last time," uh, 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 you know, and I and I found the diaries then and thought, "Okay, there's something to write about in the diaries." And then after I did that, I put them away, and that was the end of it. This time was the first time I actually analyzed them as um, a human being wrote them. I was just looking for broader jokes, I think, when I wrote for New York Woman magazine. But um, I'm not even sure what I said. You know, I don't know. If, I have a feeling you don't do this either, Susan. Do you never read your stuff again after you write it? Never, 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 never. I'm afraid. I I'm am afraid never too. read, never. I, I only, only if I'm forced to because. You have to do a reading. Yeah, I'm doing a reading. I, no, never, never, never. I, I'm afraid I'm going to look at it and go, oh, what was I thinking? I should have rewritten this. I should have made it shorter. I should have made it tighter. I should have it yeah. I, or, and I mean, that feeling of, oh, God, I can't believe I used that word. That's just the wrong word. I No, I've never read anything of my, I've never sat down and read my books once I've been either. I, in fact, I get terrified of them. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, and there are writers who read their stuff all the time, and I don't think it's a character flaw. I just can't imagine doing that. No, I, I can't either. Well, I'm happy to hear that you don't either. And I, I'm not alone in this particular version of the neurosis. Right, you really join me in that neurosis. Um. How has the political turbulence of the past four years affected, or hasn't it, your ability to create? It's, uh, well, Susan and I both put a book out, and so it didn't totally, it's been horrible. I mean, really, I for me, it's just been horrible. I, I don't even think of it as turmoil so much as I just think of it as um, a constant level of abuse. It's everything that I, I hold, dear and I think is valuable in this world being negated. It's from one thing to the next, including the environment and everything. And just, there's nothing that I, that I feel strongly about that receives support from that guy. And then the, that's that crazy talking and punishing people and insulting everybody. And it's been horrible. Don't you agree? Uh, horrible. Actually, I found work to be um, something of a refuge. I mean, yeah. I don't write about politics, so it's, you know, I just get absorbed in what I'm writing about and block out what's going on. Um, I guess that's what the drawing of these of this book was for me, is once I started in on the drawings, I would go days at a time and forget that there was a political scene. It was, it was drawing is different than writing just by the way. I, you know that right brain, left brain thing. Drawing is right brain. It's the kind of thing where I can sit down and start drawing in the morning and then look up and it's seven o'clock at night. I never am that with writing. Writing, you have to be there the whole time. You don't drift, you don't float, you don't, I don't get lost. I'm present the whole time. Mm -hmm. I, you can actually just sort of drift when you're drawing. It's a, it's a whole other thing. I, I'm, I envy that. Um, were your diaries some of the objects you took with you when you had to evacuate for the fire? 
No, <laughs> um, well, actually, uh, it depends which fire, you know, I've evacuated for three different fires. And, you know, we've already had three fires out here this year. I'm, I'm my fingers crossed on that. I did not take my, uh, you know, I did, I, the last fire I had to evacuate in 2018 and I was already um, working on this book. So I actually, now that you, I think about it, I did, uh, I did take those diaries because I had all big boxes worth of drawings that I had to evacuate with. It was, that was before I was working digitally and, and I thought I can't lose all this stuff or I'm screwed. Oh. It was loose paper and stuff. It was, it was yeah, that's, that's scary. I mean, every time you hear stories about people who take their single typewritten manuscript and leave it in a cab and you just think, oh, I would just like jump off a bridge. You remember the olden days of the computer where the computer would eat your manuscript? Oh God. Yeah. I lost, uh, I never lost, I lost a lot of big chunks of work where I would be working on a computer and then suddenly I think, where did, where did that go? And it was gone. Um, and I became philosophical about it. I always thought that what I came up with after that was better, but it's not an experience you want to go through. It's it's pretty yeah. wretched. Well, I I guess I, I haven't had that happen in a pretty long time. I don't want to, uh, as uh, Andy, who lives with me says, don't boast while the gods are watching. But uh, I, haven't, I haven't had that happen. I, I think it's because I have hard drives now. I have external hard drives and I save things multiple places just yeah. in case. Well, I think it's gotten much better. I mean, when I first started working on a computer, I think they you were, were early in the game. You yeah. Were early. Yeah. And they were glitchy and they were, um, I mean, things would literally disappear. And it, I remember writing a piece, not a long piece, but the entire piece disappeared. And it was interesting to see how much I could reconstruct from memory and that it ended up being better. I know it was better, but you don't want to go through it. It's, it's horrible. And at times I think it would be really devastating. It's really terrifying. I think we have time for one more question. Um, uh, oh, this is one I love. What advice do you have for the German Shepherds who are moving into the White House? I'm so happy they're moving in with Biden and not with the guy who's there. <laughs> Mr. Non-Dog, though. I yeah. mean, I'm so happy he doesn't have a dog. I mean, that would be horrible for him to have a dog. It would be a really mistreated dog. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, um, I I don't know how to what to say about that because my advice would be for the people who, for the Bidens and I I would have to hope that the Bidens are good pet owners they look good they like they seem to like the dogs I would don't, get dogs to stay in touch with me and if anything goes wrong I'll look into it over. I do wonder sometimes people who have lives like the Bidens must have which is a million obligations and being sort of moved from place to place, how, what percentage of their life is sort of normal where they feed the dogs and watch Netflix? I mean, does that ever happen? Do, you know, because then you think, well, if you have dogs, you do have to, I mean, you can pay people to take care of them. I'm guessing they pay a dog walker. Probably. I'm, I know lesser people than the Bidens who pay one. <laughs> right. right. It's just, I, I'm so curious about how much normalcy extraordinary people can manage. In the White House? Well, you know, this is the first time, I mean, watching, watching the last four years is the first time I've ever had the thought that there's a president sitting and watching television because right. he's watching television all the time. I mean, you certainly didn't get the idea that Obama was sitting in front of a TV looking for ideas for foreign policy. I mean, he seemed to be 
working all the time. This guy is on TV. Yeah, I'm sitting on social media, for God's sake. I mean. Yeah. Uh, so it really gives you a different picture of what the day the day's obligations for a president are at their minimum, because obviously he's working at the minimum. Right. Yeah, I think. But I, I guess I'm always curious how people with children and dogs and who otherwise have lives that don't seem <clears throat> very normal. Yeah. Those are things that require, it doesn't matter how fancy you are, your dog needs to get fed and take a walk. And um, I'm just always curious about it. Well, I'm guessing that, uh, you know, pretty much all the people I know who have any amount of income and have kids have an assistant. Right. So a lot of, um, a lot of this guessing Jill Biden has an assistant. That's just, or more, or a whole office full of assistants. To right. Yeah. I, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. And that you delegate a lot of stuff, but, um, those I don't know where they keep the dog. I've never seen anybody do a report on where the dogs spend the day either. You know, like where are they? Are they sitting in the the presidential residence in the White House? Yeah, where are they all day long? They 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 to, they them out for a photo or whatever, and they're standing with someone on the lawn, pretty much solid. A lot of presidents have gotten puppies. Yeah, um, in the White I mean, House. Um, you know, I've never seen a report where they follow the dog around all day, and you see, well, now he's sitting in the bedroom, and now he's sitting in the right. Actually. Room. It would be interesting to have a GoPro on a White House dog and just say, all right, li literally, what do you do during the day? Where do you hang out? Or if they want to hire me to follow the dogs around all day, I have cameras. I all right. To do it. I think, unfortunately, we have to end. Um, but two things. Number one, thank you, Meryl, for really – I enjoyed this so much and well, thank you so much i'm so i was so excited that you said yes to this i really appreciate it thank it you a treat and um everyone should buy the book it's it, it's not just funny it's very moving i i found it very moving and there were moments where i thought oh my god it's my childhood i'm experiencing my childhood uh which i loved well, that was the thing I realized, you know, I used to really worry when I was a kid about that maybe I wasn't special and there was nothing special about me and therefore I could never have a career that I really wanted because I wasn't special enough. And I realized I really, I I was so busy worrying that I wasn't special. I didn't realize that it's okay to have tons of things in common with people. That is basically what I had when I was a kid. It was me and following pop media along, being pulled along by the nose by pop media. And um, not, I, and by the way, aren't you glad you didn't grow up during social media? Oh my God. I, you know, it's funny. I, I think about it all the time. I mean, my son is 15. It's his reality. And I, I think it's quite, toxic in many ways. I mean, there are things about it that are great. I'm on social media. For kids, I think it's really horrible. And what, um, we had this thing, slam books, where you used to make fun of people. And oh, God. Really I still have some of my slam books. Oh, really? Wow. Yes. Yes. Uh, but take that. Take it and have everybody in the world to see it, and including on other continents and other countries. And, you know, where people can anonymously say you're fat and ugly. And, and it was so who, I didn't. Who knew exactly who was saying it. And it was usually circulated among about 15 people. Yeah. And they yeah. were all anonymous. Now, it, I, mean, I mean, the amount of hurt that can be inflicted on a kid now through that stuff, I don't even want to imagine what that would be like. But I hope. Yeah. Someone figures out a way to teach people, kids to protect themselves from it. Well, if you want a chilling um, two hours, watch The Social Dilemma. And Oh, I've seen it. Oh, well, you know, you, you turn it off and you just think we're doomed. We're doomed. <laughs> and on that happy note. <laughs> yeah, really. And now, <laughs> yes, let's continue feeling cheerful. 
Um, congratulations on the book. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much again. And thank you everyone for coming. Um, and thank you for great questions. Yes, thank you very much. I don't know even how to turn off being on this, so I may be on this for the I'll rest. Just of be time. here for the rest of time. <laughs> right. I'll go ahead and help you out. Uh, so we'll go ahead and wrap it up there, Meryl, Susan. Okay, thank you, you for awesome. your help. Thank you so much. Um, everybody in the audience, thank you so much for coming. Again, make sure you buy Meryl's book by clicking that green button down below. Make sure you have a look at, at um, his hats behind Oh, yeah, my little hat collection in the back. <laughs> uh, but thank you so much, everyone, and have a good night. Good night. Good night.